Yeah, that's a good. So, Linda, what's happened so far is three of us have just checked in, and um, the check-in question is just uh, because we've got uh, Christine with us, who's a new member in our group. We thought we'd sort of just to give a bit of a broader context of our experience in this group and where we are. So, just tell us in your check-in where you're from, and what's your experience of this group. How are you feeling now? And what are you bringing to today's conversation? Oh. Wow. <laughs> well, and if you, if you need a reminder of any of those, just let us know. So. <laughs> I'm and, sorry, I just come from two doctors of things. Well, um, Linda Eleanor, um, you said, what's my experience? Is that the first question? In, in this group. What, what's your experience of this group? I love this group. It's been, um, wow, we've been meeting, I think, since 2000 and... 14, 15, something like that. Um, it's been a very good uh, touch in group with respect to our various uh, focuses on climate. Um, I have been, you know, feeling very out there myself, not really knowing what others were doing. So this has been, been a really good group for me um, uh, as we share similar backgrounds and ways of viewing climate change and the challenges. So that's been great. Uh, what's the next question? I'm sorry. Um, how are you feeling now and what are you bringing to this conversation? Well, I'm a little harried because I had a lot of appointments today and it's just back to back. Um, so I'm feeling, you know, the stress of going from one thing to the other. Um, and the final ones, what do I bring today? Um, hmm. Well, I'm, I'm rededicating myself to... Uh, work I used to do. Oh, and I'm from, by the way, I'm from Laguna Niguel, although I've just moved back here from um, Southern Arizona. So I'm still kind of integrating into my, what had been my old community is now my new community. Uh, what I'm bringing today is kind of a recommitment to my, uh, to work I used to do with Bohm Dialogue. And I just noticed, Mark, you, you said something about dialogue. So I'm very excited uh, that Mark actually is going to be kind of taking us through the theory. You are familiar with it because, of course, dialogue came out of Peter Senge's work and in the early 90s and certainly changed my life uh, dramatically. So with Otto Scharmer kind of building on Senge's work, um, I'm looking forward to what Mark has to say and to kind of re-familiarize uh, myself with it. Dialogue is a huge part of theory U. So... I'm just all ears and ready to ready to go now that I've kind of settled settled in a little bit. <laughs> Is that was that pretty much it, Mark? Excellent, thanks, Linda. And you're just passing the the talking piece back into the centre as you finish, and someone else can pick it up now. <clears throat> so may I pick it up, Mark? Absolutely, Jim. Uh, so um, I'm Jim Weber, and. Uh, I live in New Hampshire, and we've already started um, the 2020 primary visit for presidential candidates, which is exciting. Um, I have learned a, a great deal in this um, in this group, and I've tried to contribute. Um, I'm very interested in kind of the faith-based. Uh, organization, particularly the Unitarian Universalist Church, of which I'm a, a very active member in Exeter, New Hampshire. In terms of um, what I bring to today's discussion, I am extraordinarily excited by uh, Theory U, and uh, I have some questions, however, and I hope that we deal with them. Um, and I plan to apply it immediately. Hmm. All right, I think that, are you, is the talking stick back in the center now? Yeah, here it is. Ah, awesome. I think I'm, I'm the one left. So my name is Christine Barrington and I'm in the Santa Cruz, Northern California area. And I'm a friend of Nancy's. And um, she invited me into this group. And particularly, uh, she's been asking me to connect with Linda for the past couple of months. My life's been very crazy. But she was really on it today because she knows that I'm extremely passionate about Otto Sharmer's work. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm feeling peaceful and good right now. Things have been very hectic and suddenly it's all cleared and settled and I've been home today working on things and, um, and I'm just very happy to hear what Mark has to share. Excellent. Well, well, thanks everybody and welcome Christine. Mm -hmm. um, so the agenda that I was proposing is that, you know, I, I just initiate, um, maybe I'll share some stories about how I, you know, been involved with Theory U. And, and I've shared a couple of um, slides with people. So, Christine, I don't know whether you've got those. But, and, and I don't know how we would get them to you. But if you, I, if you I have them. I have what you oh, see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you would have seen them before if you're really yeah, keen I'm on Otto so Sharma. So. Yeah. Mark, you can always share your screen if you know how to do that. I, I can share my screen. Okay. Well, it's, it's probably not such a critical thing. And what, what I'll do is... Um, just go over a couple of the models of Theory U and then to keep it in the dialogue practice, uh, allow each of us, like as Jim said, Jim's got some questions, but we also have some experiences ourselves with Theory U. So we'll go through a, a several rounds of uh, dialogic conversation, just exploring what's our experience. And one of the, the ideas that I've put in there is that even sharing an experience, if you've used Theory U or, or can frame some of your life experiences in terms of Theory U, if you can remember a, a powerful experience that you've had that fits into that model, I'll invite you to share that. And I've got one that I can share that might sort of stimulate your own thinking too. So, um, and then we can explore, you know, questions that come up rather than as an interrogation, mm -hmm. more as sort of emerging uh, insights that we're exploring together collectively. And we'll, we'll just see how that goes. And depending on the energy that we've got, we can continue that for the time that we've got until we um, uh, come through to our end time when we can uh, check out. So there might be some logistics things too that we might need to just deal with for um, setting our expectations for the future of how this group meets. Because there was a few people who were a bit surprised about today coming up and didn't have internal mechanisms for um, tracking that. Um, Anyone got any questions before we start about the agenda or anything they'd like to add? Christine? I, I would. Um, yeah, I thought this call was happening next week. And so Nancy <laughs> called me just a few hours ago. So I'm going to have to leave early. So if I just disappear, you know why. But okay. next time I'll come. Well, one of, the, one of the things, Christine, just to honor your presence with us, it'd be lovely to make sure you get a chance to, um, you know, just speak into the circle as well. Uh, before you go. So don't just sort of disappear. We'll just let us know in a bit of advance. We'll get you a chance to check out or okay. express yourself before you go because okay. it's really valuable having uh, diverse points of view and you're a new uh, element in our system. So you'll probably add a lot of uh, great juice for us all by being here. <laughs> Thank you. That's nice. Okay. Anyone else got any other um, questions or additions to the agenda or the process? Okay, well, let me, uh, so I've, I've shared two slides, but um, the, maybe I should just tell a little bit of a story how I got involved with Theory U. And it really, my work has, when I first, my degree's in mathematics, but when I left university, I, um, I got into a, a, an outdoor experiential learning uh, organisation called Outward Bound, which took young people and adults into nature as a way of uh, you know, having an experience, a learning experience that where they could reflect on themselves and look at their behavior. And, and so I got into leadership development through that and um, you know, designing uh, activities in nature that challenged people as leaders to reflect on their own behavior. So I've learned a lot of my facilitation skills and, and probably even dialogue practice through uh, those types of experiences, although uh, my work has moved from there, uh, so not so much being present in nature, but um, uh, working with groups using experiential learning, so using real experience to reflect on learning. And also that experience could be anything from a physical experience, an emotional experience, or even a spiritual experience, and learning to observe that and reflect on it collectively in a in a safe container. So these are all sort of jargon words that 
fit into the theory U context. But in doing that work, I, I was first exposed to Peter Senge and the fifth, the, the five disciplines of learning. And that was a, 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 you know, an amazing array of different skill sets and paradigms. And then Otto Sharma came in, in collaboration over the, you know, the last few years with, he was a, a student of, uh, you know, those MIT practitioners in this space. I won't go into them all, you know, um, but, uh, you know, we could explore that further if we needed to. Um, and I think the, the way, uh, it first came across for me was in presencing, just that idea of presencing being, being present and connected, which is actually at the, at the bottom of the U. Um, I found myself, uh, being involved with a guy called John Milton who, uh, runs, uh, in, I think he's in California and he's come out to Australia a couple of times and I've been involved with a group of people here where we've, uh, done, uh, solo experiences in nature and uh, Joseph Jaworski and other leadership practitioners had written on synchronicity and presencing uh, about a, a powerful transition experience is um, doing one of John Milton's uh, sort of sacred passages where a group of people would collectively um, hold an intention of being together in nature and then individually go to a site in nature for a few days and um, just spend time with nature uh, and then come back together. Um, or what I found when we did it in Australia that, um, you know, John has a more relaxed approach to debriefing that, but uh, I found that it was really valuable to hear each person's story of their experience and then, and then reflect on the emerging insights that were coming out of that and the and the collective meaning making of that and i've had with some of my colleagues in australia had um really some quite powerful experiences of and it's it's often it's very still and very silent but when we collectively share uh, our insights um and people can be quite vulnerable about uh you know the things that come up for them so uh, it's a really fantastic vehicle for um, dialogue and deep listening uh, and also for really shifting the emotional energy in, in yourself and collectively in a group. Um, so, you know, I find in my leadership work that those types of moments are, are fairly rare because often uh, leaders hang on to a lot of paradigms about their role and controlling and are reluctant to um, let things go enough and to be self-aware enough to allow something that's uncontrollable, an emergent uh, thing that uh, we don't know where it's going to go to come up. And I've actually had quite a few experiences where leaders have, have uh, stepped in with their discomfort and, and used their power to subvert that, that process. So, I've learnt over the years to negotiate with people who want to explore, um, you know, systems and personal change uh, through these sorts of processes to let them know in advance that they will be triggered emotionally by something not being uh, understandable or in control and, and to be curious about that and to listen to it and to lean into it and stay in, uh, in dialogue and connection with others. So, uh, despite that advice, some people still can't uh, control themselves. But I, I'm, I've developed more confidence in being able to stand for that way of um, being uh, rather than just uh, intellectually exploring things. So it's been an interesting journey for me. But look, you, you'll probably get, you'll get triggered by some of the things that I'm saying and want to add some of your own. But I'll, So that's a little bit of my experience. I can go into a bit more of that. But... Um, I don't actually base my work around theory U, but it's a very helpful, um, you know, trajectory for anyone dealing with change in their life. So it's a, I would say it's a, a really simple model to apply at, uh, at a superficial and a very deep level in, in any situation. So I'll just go over the model itself. And a lot of, I sort of feel a bit embarrassed talking about it because a lot of you are familiar with it, but I'll overcome my embarrassment and just uh, stay curious rather than judgmental. Um, so the, the first slide there, the, the bottom one where the yellow arrow is arcing um, as a U is, is what the model's about. So it starts with uh, downloading 
Um, and Otto Sharma would uh, just describe that as just consistently maintaining the existing system. We just look for evidence and points of view that already maintain our existing worldview and ways of behaving. And, and as we use the, the U, and the, and the U theory developed from interviewing uh, in a dialogic way, change makers all around the world. And some of you might, might know the details of this, but I think you know, over 70 people in all sort of walks of life, Otto Sharma as part of his work with Peter Senge uh, and others, um, you know, just talk to people about uh, what their experience was of how change happens. And collectively out of that, this model was developed. So in, in its essence, there's three phases to the model and it's called going down the U on the left-hand side is really the practice and skill sets and, and ways of being of observing and noticing. And even that uh, has got many layers to it. Uh, and listening is one of the, the best ways for anyone to be an observer. Uh, listening, and, and Otto Sharma's got a model of listening, which has just got four layers to it. Um, and one is downloading, uh, which is sort of your, maintaining your existing worldview. The second one is factual. So we're listening for things that are facts, which actually means that we're prepared to question things that we're certain about when we listen for facts. When we're downloading, we don't even uh, want to question any of our existing beliefs. So that's the start of the scientific method when we listen for the factual information. And then the third level of listening is uh, empathic listening or listening for the emotional energy that's in the system in yourself and in other people and being able to recognize that, uh, which is emotional intelligence, but it's uh, being able to observe what's going in the system and separate yourself from those emotions. Uh, the fourth level of listening is generative uh, listening, which is actually listening for what's not being said or what is emergent or is, is wanting to be born in the system. And, and that, that's probably the best practice for that is actually uh, Bohmian dialogue, uh, you know, um, where we just hold our and suspend our judgments or our assumptions. So when we're listening generatively, we notice what's coming in to challenge our existing assumptions and worldviews without being triggered by that, as well as what's uh, emerging in it for others. So as we go down that U, um, Sharma talks about moving from three different stages of openness. The first one is open mind. So, can, and, and this is a, the quality of listening factually. Can we open our mind, our rational part of ourselves? Uh, and that's dealing with the voice of judgment. So in that slide, the VOJ stands for voice of judgment. And then the, the next level of, of listening or, or observing in the system. So is, uh, uh, the voice of cynicism or uh, the emotional uh, empathic element is opening our heart, listening for um, the emotional quality that's in the system. And then the, uh, the deeper level as we get down to the bottom of the U is uh, open will. And that's the, the voice of fear uh, might block us from opening up our will. So there's a sense there that we, as we're observing the system, we're starting, as we move through the voice of judgment, the voice of cynicism, and the voice of fear, we starting to let go of things and open up. And uh, the sort of profound moment in this model is at the bottom of the U. And you can see in the diagram there, there's a sort of a break in the line from coming down the left-hand side of the U, then there's a dot at the bottom of the U and moving up to the right-hand side of the U. And that's called presencing. And what it is is uh, not moving into action and uh, just being present, relaxed and connected, uh, aware of the whole system and, and just being curious in that space uh, and allowing it to hold itself. So it's a, it's a meditative practice in some ways. And a lot of the, the experiences that uh, Otto Sharma's held to do the presencing work has been going into nature as a way of people not only observing what's happening in themselves and in the system, because nature 
can offer so much as you deepen your awareness of what the systems are that are around you or even just the animals or uh, your internal processes. So that presencing allows uh, the transition from observation into the emerging, he, he calls it leading from the emerging future. Uh, so rather than sort of basing your future on reconstructing the past, you're allowing yourself to let go of all the past, but having fully observed everything that's happening as best you can. And then um, there's this sense that the future, if you can hold this container, the future will emerge. So, uh, and if we do it collectively, uh, there's even more energy in the system. So this is, moves into the design methodologies of IDEO and, and others who are using creativity to prototype ideas, or first of all, this idea of letting come. So on the left-hand side of the U, you're letting go and then staying present and, and staying there as much as you need to. And, and really the richer experience happens when you can stay in presence uh, as much as you can. And then letting come. So you're sensing the emerging future and he calls that uh, crystallizing. But before you sort of lock into any particular pathway, um, you, you start to uh, look at a, a way to do that without attachment. Um, so prototyping is genuinely, it's not um, piloting. Uh, a piloting process means you're sort of a bit attached to a particular methodology, whereas prototyping is very, experimental you know you're just really prepared to risk trying something out and observe what's happening and learn from it and as you move up the right hand side of the U this proto crystallizing and prototyping starts to uh, have an impact as you reflect on how that works uh, through experiential learning and you'll find things start to shift in the system and you want to um, embody those or integrate them or make or turn them into uh, practices that you want to continue to use or even uh, in your governance structures to um, you know lock in new ways of doing so they become institutionalized in the end but of course uh, as anything becomes institutionalized it become it can also become um, static and uh, you know uh, not open to questioning again as well we get a lot of bureaucracy through that so this that cycle can continue again so that's that's the a quick a snapshot of the U process. In that diagram there, I've also got um, what Sharma's noticed. There's, there's also another response to disruption uh, from the downloading experience. The presencing loop is where you lean in with curiosity, courage and compassion, which is open heart, open mind and open will. But equally, there's another response that we all are very familiar with, which is absencing which is closed heart, closed mind and closed will. And, you know, like it's, we've got nothing better than our world today to show how those forces are, are often prevailing in our governance systems um, and especially in, in your country, but uh, it's definitely happening in mine as well and all around the world. So we shouldn't sort of uh, say we don't all have this in our systems. Um, so that's uh, when you um, are absencing, your, your, the voice of judgment and the voice of cynicism and the voice of fear are prevailing at every step of the way and they drive the system. So you deny things, you desensitise yourself, you hold on to uh, existing patterns uh, and there's, a, there's an absencing, there's a stuckness and then it gets into manipulating and deluding and abusing. So that, that's the, the mirror of the presencing system in the absencing system. So, yeah, and Sharma's got quite a lot of work around, uh, you know, that, that simple model. So, and those of you who are here might be able to add to that as well. I'll just transition now into um, another framework. Like, there's a lot of frameworks in Theory You Work. And um, this one here is about uh, using personal transformation and systems transformation, you know, uh, collectively in the same space. And... Uh, he has some models about, um, and, and you, many of you would have seen the work from Peter Senge and others about the iceberg and the layers of where you intervene in the system at, at an event level or whether you go deeper into the mental models and worldviews. I think Donella, Donella Meadows has a fantastic uh, framework for that, places to intervene in the system. So 
this matrix here is just a, an overview of um, how he's used uh, the operating systems that we're working in and our capacity to observe it and talks about four levels of, uh, of, of an operating system. So 1.0 is the traditional authority and input centric operating system, command and control type operating systems. Uh, operating system 2.0 is output and efficiency centric. And we would have seen this, those of us who've worked in organisational development, we would have seen these transitions in organisations trying to learn how to be more effective have gone through some of these stages. Um, and then uh, operating system 3.0 is where it's focused on the stakeholder and, you know, the, or the, the customer or, or in this sense, the patient or the student in whatever system we're looking at in. And then the, the usefulness of uh, the theory you work is, is working towards a system that is generative uh, and, um, you know, he calls this awareness-based collective action for, in terms of, uh, you know, how we're trying to do things collectively. So um, that, that matrix looks at the health system, the education system, the food system, finance system, management and governance with those three lens, uh, four lenses of the different operating systems and being aware of that. And that, that framework can be helpful for people who, uh, you know, are stuck in a, a particular way of seeing something and uh, where you can move to and where you can move from in terms of how we deal with, uh, you know, managing transitions and change. Look, I sort of feel like that's enough talking from me. So there's a, there's a few ways we could go now. And maybe, the, maybe I'm just suggesting we do this, that, you know, you've got your own thinking around this and you've got some questions about it and some things you'd like to explore. So I'll pass the piece back into the centre and allow you to, first of all, share your own experience of Theory U, if you've had some. What's been the most powerful experience for you with Theory U? And uh, if you haven't had the experience with Theory U before, um, you know, what's some questions that are emerging for you or some insights or lines of inquiry that you'd like to explore further from what we've just talked about so far. So I'll pass the piece in the centre. Well, I, uh, I wanted to say thank you um, so much, Mark. And I just, I wanted to say a couple of brief comments because I may be cutting out soon. Um, just wanted to say that my understanding is that this is a model that he derived from observing the natural process that leaders went through when they were being creative and getting new insights. And so um, I'm, I'm really curious about it in that way, as a way of um, being a model for what happens in the creative process, not just in individuals, but in groups as well. And um, I did do a training with Adam Cahane, uh, Change Labs training once at an Alia Summer Institute, which is really based on Theory U. And in his way of doing it, there's you know different techniques that they use at different points of the process in order to kind of stimulate what's supposed to be happening at that point. And um, so that's one way of working with it. And the the other part of my experience with it is that people in Europe have often come to us and said that when they do a three or four hour dynamic facilitation process with a group of people, they feel that people naturally move through all those stages. They move through downloading what they believe they already know to being in a state of kind of connecting with a sense of mystery about how complex it all is and then emerging into a space of creativity and experimentation. So that's a more spontaneous way of approaching it. It's not like we're trying to do the theory you, but we're just noticing that that pattern emerges in certain kinds of contexts. So that's it for now. I'm gonna put the piece back in the center. Thank you, Rosa. That, um, that actually helps me say what I wanted to say a little more easily. I, I've not been through a formal theory you process other than uh, with Otto Scharmer doing one of his MOOCs and I've never followed the whole MOOC through 
in fact, it's an interesting aside. I just learned uh, recently that most MOOCs drop most of their people. In fact, most MOOCs only um, retain about 15% to the very end. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and I think largely because it's so large that people get lost, you know. Uh, but that's, I mean, this is necessarily just a MOOC experience. What I guess I am curious about is for those of you who have actually been through a Theory U process, um, like Rosa said, what I notice using dialogue is that if you stay in the dialogue long enough, other than maybe the prototyping and the, um, the, actually, the, the actual taking of actions towards some you know, goal uh, is outside the dialogue container, yet if you follow the U all the way around, there's always a place to insert dialogue to maintain the system's coherence with, you know, with what's really happening. So I guess I'm kind of curious, for those of you who have actually been through a theory you process, is there an attempt to lay down, you know, dialogic guidelines that people are actually learning, you know, to dialogue as they go through the U experience? Or is it something, they, do they use different techniques? I guess that's my, my basic question. Actually, maybe rather than just answering these questions as they come up, if we just do a round where everyone just gets to express themselves in whatever way first, and then we can explore these sorts of questions that are coming up too after that. I'll place the piece back in the centre. Christine. Okay. Well, uh, I have been swimming around in Otto Scharmer's work for a long time, but I have never actually gone through the process with a group. It's just that so many of his ideas and what he expresses in very big picture describes a world I understand innately. And I'm very excited that they're trying to get it out in the world. But what I want to say about what you shared is that it was really wonderful for me to experience your description of the you process through your understanding. It was a very earthy, easy to understand way of describing it. And so I'm really glad it's being recorded because I'm gonna listen again and uh, with your permission, perhaps share it with uh, the young man that Nancy wanted to come on the call today, who's also gonna do this societal transformation lab experience. It was really, it just gave me another point of reference that I found very valuable. So thank you. Well, I can, I can chime in some. I really appreciate all the comments that have come so far. And I also loved your summary. Um, I, I'm an avid uh, embracer of reading and understanding it. And like Christine, it, it really called to me. It made so much sense, um, the theory you. And, um, and like Rosa, so I've, I've read and I've been on some webinars and I find that Otto, Otto Scharmer's approach is very conceptual. And where I have always practiced is in the design. How do you take, take something conceptual like this and how do you really operationalize it into actual steps that you would take a group or a system through? That, those are two extremely different things. And like Rosa, I had a, the opportunity to go through two Theory U trainings with Rio's partners, um, which is Kahane's firm. It wasn't um, Adam. It was this incredible guy, I'm forgetting his name, um, who is extremely generous and extremely skilled and I, I developed and have this huge toolkit of um, uh, practices for each step along the way um, and I have been in I've used it it's kind of merged with a lot of my facilitation practice some of some of the steps um, for example um, I mean one of the things I love about theory U and it, it's true of other processes, true. But when you're with a group, uh, and a you know a group, a system, you know they're they're there to do some work, to get to a different place. You want to set a tone from the beginning that opens up these possibilities and doesn't have them just in downloading mode. 
So even if you're not going to go through the whole you process, almost whenever you're with a group, you, you want something right in that beginning, at least I do, that tries to make them see that they're in a new place. You know, here we are all together. This is a new possibility for us, this moment. And one of the exercises that they did, and I don't know that I can describe it all that well, but I want to give you a taste of this because I've used this with groups. And, um, and I also developed a creativity course um, through my, with my technology of participation colleagues um, and was heavily informed in that course by some Theory U ideas. And in fact, this exercise is in the course. Um, but it's, to, it, it's early on when you're getting the container set for a group and you want them to totally be as present as possible in the beginning and also have a fluidity of mind in that open sensing beginning phase of Theory U or of any group. And the exercise is to get everyone standing up in the room, give a little space for this, and then you have everyone walk around the room just like they're at an airport and they're rushing to the gate. So imagine, be yourself, be in this room, and now you're walking to the gate just be in that space, how you are when you're walking to the airport gate. So you get every, people are just buzzing around the room. People aren't looking at each other. People are just doing this thing to just get to the airport gate. And then you have them, I forget the second step, but the second step is another situation where you have them slow down a little bit more. And they're walking in a, a slightly more aware posture. There might be three ways you have them walk, but the final way you have them walk is being fully present. So you have all the time in the world, you're feeling just fully relaxed, you really um, are in no hurry, and in fact, you just really wanna take your time now and just, just mosey around the room. And furthermore, you wanna start noticing who else is in the room. So you start to get people looking at each other and um, the whole energy of the room is just totally transformed by this point. And then you slowly have someone organically move into a position with a partner. And then from that point, you can do a number of things in that partner relationship. But usually there's some um, empathic listening exercise that you do right at that point. Nothing too touchy or feely, but you do something about having them introduce each other and share something. So if that's really tailored to the group situation. I just share that because I've used that exercise three or four times and it never fails to get, um, I, I always have at least two people come up to me afterwards and just say, that did something to me energetically. I just suddenly felt the shift. And again, that's just a very concrete example of the types of tools that Real Spreaders brought to the Theory U experience. Um, another one I'll just mention is dialogue interviews. Um, which again is in the front end of the, the U. Um, and these again, you tailor to whatever your specific need are, but they're really a way to get people in that. Mark, you mentioned the four levels of listening, and I can't remember them right now that Otto has, but the dialogue interviews are helping people go down that listening loop and practice on a one-to-one -one dyad um, more active listening. So what we did, the, the one place where we applied some of these tools in a big systems change operation as I worked with a colleague and we were hired by a network of um, social service providers for safety net services. You know, this is homeless, drug addiction, people that are really at the most vulnerable place in our county. And these providers were convened by their funders to have some sort of creative breakthrough about the system about we've got to change something about how we're providing services to these most vulnerable uh, people. So um, I'll tell you two stories from this and then I'll, I'll shut up. Um, but the one was the dialogue interviews. So we had people in this room. I mean, we had 70 people in the room. And so we would have people that have power, that have powerful roles in the county government around overseeing social services and overseeing probation services. And we would have, we had clients in the room. We had um, people that were frontline staff in the room. So people would be doing dialogue with people in very different roles than their own, with different power, different levels of power in the system than they sat. 
and, and creating these connections through these personal dialogue interviews to create empathy and understanding of the system from a different perspective. Um, and the last thing I'll share that we really didn't succeed, by the way, this project didn't succeed. <laughs> I mean, some good things came out of it. But the, the biggest lesson was that you don't set up a system to have the breakthrough when everyone's really invested in the system as it is now. And this brings me to my final point about what I learned about Theory U. And that's when you're at the bottom of that U and when you're talking about letting go and letting come. My biggest insight from the training and also what we tried to do with this group when you get to that point is you have to realize that letting go <laughs> means you're ready to see your how you are implicated in the current system for holding a dysfunctional pattern and you have to be willing to let you have to have courage to be able to let that go and believe that you can truly imagine this emergent future that still has you in it <laughs> but perhaps in a very new way. And we could not, we couldn't, we could not bring them over that. Um, so I will stop there. I'll put the stick back in the middle. Christine? Um, I'm going to have to leave in the next couple of minutes. And what I want to say is I'm really, really bummed that I have to go. Um, I really appreciate, um, is it Marty, what okay. you shared? Thank you. I'm going to look forward to listen to the recording to hear what other people share. This has been very helpful. And it's been a pleasure to get a little bit acquainted with all of you. So well, thanks for coming, Christine. And uh, we look forward to you're more than welcome to come back in the future. So <laughs> thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> so Jim, did you want to say anything? Yes, I would like to. Um, it was a terrific overview. Thank you, Mark. Um, I uh, was in the um, dental office waiting for my wife's $400,000 operation <laughs> uh, today. Um, and, in, but, and I was uh, reading, uh, I guess, the last of all those books and some of the papers and so on. And what I found was that I immediately applied it to uh, the uh, the church of which I'm a board member, and um, the church, <clears throat> the Unitarian Church, Universalist, uh, and particularly ours, is fragmented in almost by definition. You sort of be come as you are, and there's no sort of overall creed in uh, coordination is an enormous problem. We spend most of our time trying to coordinate ourselves without being able to say no to, to any new proposals or that kind of thing. And of course we have silos, but there's no guiding set of ideas. There's no, uh, no way that thought can enter the system, which is uh, amazing to me. Uh, we have a, of course, we have a mission statement, but it's just two lines, and that's not a, a framework. That's not a uh, enough direction or detail. Uh, and so, this kind of theory, then, to me, uh, uh, would be a great way to overcome that uh, fragmentation, and uh, it would be a lot. A lot more valuable than a strategic plan, and uh, and we're right close to MIT. I don't know why we can't take advantage of, of that connection. Um, so another thought was that we, in essence, we don't have time to think, and the thinking we do is of poor quality, which is one of Otto's major points. That, that we kind of allow time and processes and practices to think. And I, that really gets me. And then the, uh, the link of the spiritual to the consciousness is of great interest and applicability. 
and the link to world movements. And one thing I'd hope we hear more about is how this, uh, how his um, website and the MIT effort is spreading around in a global sense. And I'd sure like to hear more about that. And then I, so that uh, we, we have many, many practices, spiritual practices, quasi-spiritual practices, yoga, you name it. Uh, but we ha it's not connected. They're not connected to a framework like a you. So we might do something up here or something over there. And, um, and, and for instance, we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to create leadership development program in the church, right? That's, we should call you, Mark, and get some advice. And, uh, but there's no context for it. I mean, there's no, someone says, well, let's, let's do Myers-Briggs. Okay, that's a great idea. Sure, let's do that. Um, and these are all just points that came out of the dental office experience. And then we have a super, somewhat, somewhat of a superstructure, and they certainly don't know how to think. This is serious stuff. Uh, in fact, they're crazy, I think. Uh, and so I'm hoping to take all these thoughts and better understanding of uh, Theory U and apply them in our board retreat in April. So that's the payoff here. Mm -hmm. And then the dentist gave me the bill. And then I said, where's Otto now that I need him? Yeah. Thanks, Jim. I, I noticed that Nancy's just joined us as well. Hey. So we'll let Nancy settle in. Um, what, so all of us have just had a round there of uh, reflecting on what's happened. What, what's just come up for me in that, uh, you know, from what Rose has said and then Linda about the dialogue and, and Marty explaining a few of the processes that have worked for her. And then you, Jim, with your dilemmas. Um, maybe just a few things. Like one of the things... I'll just describe three different processes, a little bit like what Marty did. And, and maybe later on we could talk about how the, how the global movement is operating as well. Um, so one of, the, one of the processes in going down the left-hand side of the U is called going on a learning journey. And Jim, it, it certainly came up for me with your closed system with the, inside your church you do need to have stimulus to come into the system to create new thinking. So one of the, one of the ways of doing that, of course, is, is having uh, other people join you, but then there you've got to have a reason for that and a, and a purpose that sort of holds that together. But even if you went uh, as your existing system on a learning journey to the edge of your system, so learning journeys happen on the edge. So, um, you know, an example would be in an education system, uh, a few people would go out to uh, somewhere where a school is innovating uh, with, with you know, young children or something. But the, the frame of reference you use in the learning journey is not to be judgmental, uh, which is a downloading way of just looking for the, what's in the system that you already know and getting those views reinforced, but go with curiosity and, uh, and these sort of four levels of listening. Uh, and you come back in after you've had this experience together and have a dialogue, which could be in, in twos or threes, about uh, what, what people noticed in the system on the learning journey. So an auto has got quite a structured process. It's quite simple. You could just get a, in fact, if you did any Google search, you'd find, or on the Presidency Institute website, there would be a, a one page description of, of how to run a learning journey. And, uh, you know, that's a useful uh, process tool for going in with open mind, open heart and open will to a part of the system that um, you want to uh, freshen up the worldviews and assumptions and perspectives around and start a rich uh, conversation. The, the, other, the other process that, uh, and these two processes I'm describing now, I would say, Otto would say they're the the leading unique differentiators in 
the theory U methodology in in uh, how he likes to run it. So one is called the case clinic, and the other one is called social presencing theatre. And uh, the case clinic is a a, a small group of uh, at least say four people. And again, you could you could do a search for this case clinic and have a a, a, a script of, yes. of anyone. You don't have to be skilled in doing it, but it's a lovely. Uh, it's actually a coaching process, so it's a peer coaching process. And each each of us have been primed beforehand to bring a dilemma, or a challenge, or a place where we're stuck inside our existing system. And the the case clinic works by uh, we identify roles at the start. So one of one of us is the case giver. So say it's me, and I'm uh, I've been ready to talk about a place where in my work and my challenges as a leader or as a team member or a, or a change agent or whatever I'm trying to do, I've got this challenge or or a stuckness or something that's um, you know causing me some uh, grief or what have you. And then there's a um, a timekeeper. And, a, uh, you know, anyway, simple facilitation roles and they just remind the group what to do. But the I, so I tell my story and each of you listens to my story, but a, a lot of uh, coaching is about giving advice. You know, we know that that's not a helpful way for people to shift their worldview or change their behaviour. The, the, the great strength of this case clinic methodology is it's about a generative and a collective generative way of listening to my case. So I've told you this story. Then there's a bit of silence together and some instructions to listen and what you're listening for as, um, as my uh, peer uh, support system is what images, metaphors and feelings uh, arose in you as I told my story. And this requires people to let go of giving me advice. But, you know, you might say something like, oh, I just had this image of a boat on the ocean in the moonlight. And, um, you know, the water was uh, rippled like this and, and there was a volcano or something like that. You know, some crazy ideas. And, and then I'd say, and the feelings coming up for me were, you know, um, sort of contraction. You know, uh, so people don't have to understand it. It doesn't have to be a rational explanation or even connect to my story for that matter. But it's a way for people just to share something that's emerged in them using images, feelings and metaphors for that story. And so Marty would tell hers, Jim, you'd tell yours, Linda. Now, by the time each of us have just listened to each other's answer to that question, it might only go for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, there's, there's this amazing uh, field I mean, in the language of theory, you a social field is being created here, a sense of connection at a different level. And after each of us have shared that, the case giver has a chance to reflect back on uh, what what they've heard. And what my experience of this is, and this can even happen in this sort of format, like what we're doing it now in a virtual meeting, that you can have a high quality conversation, dialogic conversation like this, but also face to face. So. Um, and Otto uses this methodology in the global MOOC on ULAB as a key way to build connection and relationship right across the planet with change agents working in these little groups. But as the case giver, I would reflect back what, what am, what's coming up for me as I hear it. And there might be something, you know, say that Marty said, you know, like, oh, Marty, when you mentioned the volcano, I just realized there's a whole lot of pent up energy uh, that I haven't expressed to you in my thing. So suddenly I, I get the chance to, and it, you, know, you can't guarantee this, but I get a chance to be more vulnerable and authentic about the stuckness in the case that I'm giving you. So this, this builds high quality relationships between people and, and people don't have to fix me. You're just listening to it. And I'm getting a sense of agency in being able to, respond to the images, feelings and metaphors that you've shared, which is a generative dialogue. And anyway, after that, we, uh, other people, you know, we, there's another round of discussing what's coming up for people. 
and uh, and then there's a closing off. So there's a sort of a, a sort of pattern of uh, working together and coming to a sort of a, a, a bit of closure. It may not be fully resolved, but then the next time we meet, one of our, like say Jim, you become the case giver, and you know we go through the same process with you. Anyway, that that's one of the powerful pieces in the U uh, Lab, which is the massive open online course, but also any face to face work that the Presidency Institute and uh, Theory you do. In conjunction with that, the the other thing is social presencing theatre, and Otto's got a, a a business partner who's been working with some 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 time, a, a Japanese woman called Arowana. And she's a, she, her practice is in, uh, you know, meditation practices mm -hmm. and art, arts practice. But, but she is a lovely practitioner of getting people who might be a bit fearful of doing this, but using their bodies as sculpture for representing elements of the system and, and allowing those sculptures to move in different ways with, you know, some simple instructions and making it safe. So you've got groups of people putting themselves into the centre of the circle in different shapes and forms, not too con contruded, but just uh, you know facing to the floor or their hands flat out or facing outwards and standing up or sitting down. And each of the players in the sculpture represent part of the system for someone. And then uh, people, without sort of intellectually controlling what you want to do, just allowing the system to change over it. So this is called four dimensional sculpture. So it's allowing uh, a, a current situation to evolve into a possible future. So someone might um, put these pieces out into the system of, you know, their role in say the education system, you know, they might be the principal of the school, the parents, the, the government department, the community and, and uh, each, each person's um, invited to uh, move their body or the person whose system it is puts their body into the shape that represents that part of the system. And uh, anyway, it's, it's quite a structured process to this. This might all sound a bit weird to you if you haven't done it before. But, uh, and then there's observers. So people sit around and watch this sculpture play out. And... And then at the end of the, the time when the, the system has come to settle, each of the players in the system are invited just to say a couple of words, you know, like they might be the principal or the teacher or the parent or the government. And, you know, so like the government might have moved in the system and say, uh, you know, I feel connected to the community. You know, that might be the sort of statement that the sculpture in that role plays. And then the, the student might say, um, you know, I'm, I'm holding my mother's hand. Uh, and then the, the principal might say, um, you know, we've got, um, you know, whatever it is. So, so anyone's, everyone observes that. You don't have to come up with any answers, but what it does, and I, this is the thing that Otto says, and I think, um, I think Marty was saying, it's a very intellectual concept, this whole theory you but actually some of the most powerful elements of it get out of the intellect and get people into uh, accelerated ways of understanding the system without talking about it or intellectualising about it, but modelling it through social presencing theatre and, and human sculptures and other technologies like that. Whoa. And what he's found is it's a very fast way to get a group of people, if, if it's safe enough for them to experiment with themselves and their bodies so you do have to hold that container but they can get a lot more deeper insight into the system dynamics through these sorts of processes than through talking about it and intellectualizing it so that would be another piece that Otto would would really strongly say is a unique process that is a really strong part of the theory you methodology anyway that's enough for me I'll put that piece back in the center thank you and maybe Nancy, we've sort of uh, let you just join us there. Is there anything you wanted to say just to check in uh, and and become present to us here? Um, first of all, I'm assuming I just now discovered it that I'm an hour late. Is that correct? Yes. 
as I've mentioned to y'all, I'm on a 12, 10 to 12 hour highway trip between Kansas City, Missouri and Dayton, Ohio. And I carefully timed it. As it turned out, I was indeed the driver to pull over just in time, go into a restaurant and be able to carry on this conversation at seven o'clock, neglecting, forgetting that I hadn't yet reached the East Coast timeline. <laughs> so, yeah, I should have been planning to do that at six o'clock. And I very much apologize. And I'm really disappointed to miss the first hour. Fortunately, I can go back to the recording, but I'm, I'm so interested in the topic. Um, the questions, and you may already have addressed this, uh, Mark, but as you, as you were speaking or coming up for me is, on the one end, how do you, what would motivate people to participate in such a process? And particularly if their core concern is to solve a problem. Um, for them to trust this process as if they're not accustomed to it, how much, anyhow, what's your experience about how you set up a context and a motivation and explanations that allow people to uh, trust this process enough to engage in it fully. And then at the other end, their sense of maybe not closure in a, in a given instance, but the longer term closure where they can, they start seeing the connections between what they experienced here and perhaps increased insight or creativity or something that they recognize as moving forward perhaps in new ways that they haven't encountered before in getting to their bottom line that's so i'd be interested if you haven't yet addressed that to hear your thoughts about that and from all of you not not just you mark thanks okay well maybe rather than just answering that question now nancy we might just uh, uh, welcome you into the group and then um uh, put the piece back in the center and if anyone else has got anything that they want to share that's emerging if you in there. want me to say anything else about where I'm at with this I don't you've seen it in writing I so I don't know what exactly since I wasn't in the check-in earlier what all you would like to be hearing from me before I just jump into questions yeah oh look that actually you'll be interested to know that your colleague uh, Christine um, yes. joined joined us uh, earlier on she had to leave just before you arrived so oh, we I'm sort so of glad she made it. yeah we introduced ourselves a bit more deeply uh, because she was a new member in the group so um, but I think uh, I mean my sense is you don't need to check in any more than what you have at the moment uh, Nancy okay. so thank that's you good. thanks so much you know I so, can I interject something yep which is which it's just popped into my mind, so I, I don't have any place to go with it. Um, but I, but I really haven't thought about the implications of this process. I mean, I appreciated what you said, Mark, about how we can see absencing in our current political situation. Um, and I'm, I think we could probably use Theory U as a diagnostic tool, perhaps to understand some of the challenges we're having with climate change, for example. Um, so it could be a diagnostic tool in that way, you know, whether it has utility for us as a design, you know, as a, to use the, the theoretical frame of its theory of change and then design a process for any particular situations of people that are grappling with trying to move us more effective. And maybe you have some experience with your work, but I just wanted to cross into our conversation the subject that has brought us together um, with this climate change. And see if anybody, I'll, I'll be percolating more, but I just wanted to get it out there. I put the, put the talking stick back in the center. Linda. Well, that kind of goes back to my initial question and just listening to everybody. Um, it, 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 this does sort of acknowledge uh, the fact that Sharmer's model, Theory U, is a really robust conceptual model. And um, I guess because I'm so process oriented, um, this has really helped me understand that first you have to really 
think through, I think Nancy, you asked the question, and Jim, you spoke to it with your church, because I've also, as you know, worked with a UU group, um, and we were trying to grow the UU group. So I, we can talk offline uh, some of the things that we did. I wish I had known Theory U back then, might have helped, but I, I can see Theory U is a really great way to conceptualize a whole change process, but you have to, you have to contextualize it, and then you have to operationalize it. It's not necessarily completely okay. um, straightforward. You know, those of us who have OD backgrounds, of course, might be able to take this great conceptual model and, like you said, Marty, use it as a diagnostic device and as a design device. But once you know the context, you're probably going to use it in a variety of ways. It's not going to be, you know, well, you dialogue here and then you do something here and then you do something over here. You're going to have to, at every step of the way, think through, well, what is this group? Where is this group right now in this change process? What are they trying to change? How can we help them better, you know, listen to each other so that they can start to see new options that might not present themselves if they're stuck, you know, in their old system. So I think it's, it's great as a conceptual model. And I can see now where I haven't taken it to heart because there isn't a specific operational way you use it. It really is going to shift and um, change, depend on the context. I, I'm, I guess I'm wanting a little bit of affirmation or acknowledgement if I'm understanding it correctly. But that, I'm, that's kind of where I am right now. Is Thank you, Mark, for helping me understand better what uh, Otto, Otto's model is actually doing and why I haven't maybe necessarily applied it. Although certainly in climate change, if, you, if you're working with you know, one group, you might be able to see where they are, you know, in the, in the U and then design some way of using it specifically. Mm. Actually, I'll, I'll pick up the piece. One, one of the things, and this fits in with what Nancy said as well, Linda, with yours, is that it's not, there, there's quite a bit of jargon and an understanding of it. So you don't want to impose it on people who haven't got that worldview because you'll just be, you know, you'll be sort of struggling, which is a lot of things. But, but you could use it as an internal framework for your design in the in the facilitation or hosting team, um, and even just understanding those three phases of the you, the observing the system, being present, and the skill sets and capabilities of that, and then prototyping the future. Uh, those three phases happen pretty much in any meeting or reflect, you know, process. So, so you can use it that way. And then uh, I've sort of said, like, you can do a shallow you uh, or a deeper you, depending on, you know, the capacity of the group that you're with to, uh, to do that. So one of the things about this sort of work is it does require people to be able to reflect on their own uh, mental models and worldviews and what have you. So, um, and, and maybe the best thing is for people who are volunteers and are ready for that sort of work. So if you're working with people without that, I think it's best not to, um, you know, they'll just, they'll just attack you around all the jargon and the modeling and the what have you on that. So it'd be better to run a process that met their needs. In fact, one of the things that um, like I'm involved in a group that's trying to make Canberra a zero emission city. And each time I meet with this group, it's at a ministerial level. I would just wish that we, you know, in the language of theory U is create the social soil. So it's basically about high quality relationships. And uh, most people are still operating out of their positional power uh, dynamics as they come into the group. And they just haven't had enough time to be with each other to invest in a, in a collective or a collaborative exercise as a group. They don't even see themselves necessarily as a, uh, as a group, they're always being um, uh, invited by the minister who has the most power. So I think that group's stuck, even though I'm thinking I, we could do a lot of work with Theory U, they're just, it's not ready for it at this stage. So for me, my work is just building what Otto would call as is the social field. So building uh, the soil and the conditions for high quality relationships and seeing what emerges out of that. I'd like it to go faster. The people that I'm doing more serious theory you work with is like currently Otto's got a, a prototype out uh, called Social Transformation Lab, 
S Lab, and a few of us in this group, as Nancy said, have uh, put a little 60 second video in to the Presencing Institute and across the planet, there's over 300 entries into that. And this is separate from the ULAB uh, massive open online course, which has had, you know, 80,000 people do it. And it works in September each year and goes for 13 weeks into December. And it's a very structured online process, but you can get into a community. I think this social transformation lab, which is starting in a couple of weeks time, um, is going to be uh, using deeper processes, but I'm not quite sure. So because we, we have been asked to be co-located and uh, because my sense is that we'll be doing some of that social presencing theatre uh, type of work uh, to understand the systems that we're working in. But I'm still guessing at this stage. So I'm in a few virtual teams and that will be a, a, a bit of an additional challenge for us on that. But already I've just had some really high quality conversations like what we're doing here on, um, on Zoom with uh, one woman's in America, she's in regenerative agriculture. And I've got another colleague in Townsville, which is several thousand kilometers from here in Australia. But we're, you know, developing a concept for being uh, an S-Lab project. So I, I can report back later on on how those go. But I see this as Otto and his team have really, they've really got a vision of making education being universally available across the planet. And, you know, they're at one of the major institutions in the world that's had a big uh, privilege boundary around it. And they're trying to open this. So all these, this sort of learning is available for free. And I don't know how they fund it. I mean, they look, they look for grants and donations. But I think they're just doing a massive exercise in social movement building uh, and systems change as a prototype for their own learning using the model that they've created and inviting other people into that conversation. So it is a, uh, and, and you know, climate change uh, initiatives are, are really, you know, in the food system, in the energy system, in governance, you know, they'll be some of the major projects that people are doing in this uh, societal transformation lab. Um, so, yeah, anyway, I'll pass the piece back in the centre. That's my experience. Uh, is the social transformation um, experience that he's doing, it is based on theory U, right? Or is, is it like a different conceptualization of his theory U? No, it's, it's, it's theory U. It's the practice of uh, applying theory U to transforming society. So Mark, um, <clears throat> so when we think about change processes, uh, <clears throat> using analysis, using creativity, using generative techniques, uh, dipping down into the bottom of the U there, there's also the, the political uh, axis of change. And you've mentioned it, Marty, and there's the, the notion that, uh, and <clears throat> that we are, I, I don't see the political dimension in Otto's work. I guess that's the question. I don't see it. I think he's trying, well, I'll just, like, I don't think he, he's trying to create containers that, because uh, even the political left right, division is a, an imposed mental model on the system that limits capacity to take effective wise action. So, um, so some of the explorations that can happen through theory U is, is even reframing very stuck politics. And, and it's based around people reflecting on their uh, behavior and the quality of their listening so that they can actually build bridges with people who they might have dismissed completely. Um, 
maybe a good a good example at a at a national political level that you mightn't hear much about in the USA is the president of Indonesia is actually um, a sponsor for a thousand senior uh, leaders in the public service doing a uh, emerging leaders integrating across sectors learning program with MIT and the Presencing Institute. They've been running it for 10 years now. And I recently met a Singaporean uh, guy who's been involved in that. Um, <coughs> and, and of course, Indonesia is, uh, you know, one of the biggest Muslim democracies in the world, and it's right next to Australia. And it's very easy for the fear and the judgment and the cynical sort of voice. It comes up in Australian media to talk about terrorism and what have you. But in a lot of ways, they've achieved a tremendous amount in, um, you know, even at the most local levels, listening to local communities and working it up. I'm not saying it's an ideal democracy, but they are a, a country at a national level using Theory U in developing their senior leaders uh, to transform the systems that they're working in. I'm not that close to it to know how it's going. Because I do know in Muslim cultures, there is a very strong power over, you know, the male uh, in the family has got more power than the women and all those types of things. But, you know, uh, there's an example there. And, and um, similarly, uh, in other parts of the world, you know, like in Scotland, they're using it, uh, you know, people in the government, ministers and departmental heads are working with communities uh, doing the massive open online course, uh, ULAB, with uh, you know business, government, and community working together, using the tools for their own uh, transforming of their system. So they've even got a dedicated website in the in the ULAB process for what's going on in Scotland. Great, thank you. Yeah, I th I think that um, I mean to me, theory you requires the system, however you're going to define it, but the stakeholders of the system to, to, make, to be a change process, not to be a, a leadership development tool, which it sounds like what it is in Indonesia. But if it's, a, if it's a, cha a transformational change process, the requirement is that, is that, there's, that, that you're assuming um, honest intent of all participants mm -hmm. to show up in the right way and to be willing to um, submit to this process. So I think when you talk about political change and entrenched power and, um, you know, there's different, different dimensions of change need to be operating in parallel all the time. So I'm not arguing for one approach to change over another. I'm just making the observation that I think Theory U, and I'd, I'd like to know others' thoughts on this, is it really requires Ideally, the participants are building trust and there's honest intent to work across difference and to work as a whole system and to address power imbalances and power over and all those things in order to be able to let emerge some sort of breakthrough process. And I think not all political change meets that criteria of being able to get those people in the room you know, with those conditions. So I, uh, excuse me, I'll, I'll pick up the stick. Uh, so the um, Otto's analysis of uh, capitalism uh, is, is very helpful and very useful. And uh, he brings it up in several ways and different times. And, uh, <clears throat> but then I, I come to um, this, this slogan, maybe it's uh, be, beware of utopian thinking. And I think that that is characteristic of his <clears throat> charts, particularly as you go down the fourth level and going across. And uh, I don't know what to do with that, but I've got a book about it. Actually, that's a really good point, um, Jim. I, I, 
even though Otto's, Otto has done a lot of work in creating those matrices and, and this sort of desired future, if you really honoured the process of theory U, it, it, the future is not predetermined or, or yes. clear that it's any of those things. The main part of theory U is that like our existing system is not working. I mean, some people would say it's working very well, but when you see how it works, it, it, it favours a certain group of people. And it doesn't matter who you vote for, those certain people keep on getting the benefits of the system and it's usually invisible to most people. So by going through a theory U process with whoever wants to be a change agent in the system, you're not trying to uh, work to a predetermined outcome. You're, okay. you're trying to take elements of the system to learn together to see it and explore how they could do that. And, and others in their exploration have come up with that 4.0 uh, sort of ways of operating but that doesn't mean that everybody should head down that path necessarily thank you yeah I, I had forgotten about his transforming capitalism thing which I I mean to me power doesn't transform power you know people with power hang on pretty tight you know systems collapse so I'm, I'd be very interested to know if he really has a, a social change strategy there or if it's just a, an educational consciousness shift, create the new field, kind of like the Sharon Joy's world, you know, approach to, to how change happens. Well, that <clears throat> um, has me wanting to ask you, Mark, in Indonesia then, <clears throat> Obviously, the government started to use the theory you so they're they're wanting to change right but do they have you know the broader segments of society like do they have the capitalists in the room do they have you know the people who really do hold the power within their society present i I don't know anything about how they're trying to yeah. use it that you'd have to do that in the u s you'd have to get the corporatists together with the with the politicians together with probably a whole variety of other stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and in a, in a society like Indonesia, you know, um, a male figure can sort of, you know, insist that other people turn up. So um, it's a, it's a compliance based system in the end, you know, people are politely respecting the authority. Um, but I do think they have got uh, those players in the room. I don't know how it plays out. Whereas in America, where it's, um, you know, every individual's got their own rights, you know, to, to create an invitation to invite those people along, um, you know, that would be, you know, a pretty challenging thing. So my, my, and Otto comes out of Germany and Europe. And uh, you know, I think his background was on a, uh, a, a walled off, um, like a Steiner uh, yeah. far, or, organic farm. So he, he sort of has a framing of, uh, you know, that uh, Steiner view of the world of, uh, you know, uh, n nature and, um, you know, food production and what have you. I think he tries to downplay that when he's talking to corporates. Uh, so he is conscious as an as a academic that, he, that he's talking to different um, cultures in organisations uh, to make it work for them. Most of the people that I think turn up for these things are people who are, you know, pretty reflective on their own behaviour, trying to develop their own self-awareness, um, you know, trying to make a difference in the world and already have explored, you know, ways to do it. Whereas people who are already successful making their power over, uh, you know, like it'd be pretty hard to get Donald Trump to sign up for this because he's already got a, a pretty solid agenda for himself already that he doesn't need to question at all. That's our president. <clears throat> um, Looks like Nancy wants to come in. Yeah, Nancy, go ahead. You're, you're on mute. You're still muted. Yeah, we can't hear you, Nancy. Okay. I'm unmuted now. Yeah, we got you. Um, so a couple of things. I, I'm so sold on the idea of finding 
cases, uh, stories that I call citizen successes that are a different way, can be I, I, a different way to break through the established uh, debating frameworks and positions if people are exposed to stories, let's say what's going on in Taiwan or what's going on, uh, as you said, in Indonesia or Scotland or, you know, several dozen other parts of the world at all levels of society and in all sectors, across all the sectors, where uh, breakthrough solutions are emerging that most people are unaware of. And you have people who but differ politically. Lighting your light on, that would really help. What did she say? Oh, I'm very... I, I didn't catch that. What did you just say? I think Linda was talking to someone in her home, Nancy, and she's just <laughs> muted oh, herself now. Okay. All right. So she wasn't talking to you. Got it. Um, so solutions from different sectors and people of different sectors looking at promising solutions can and then queer, asking queries about these that, you know, invite exploration, stretching the imagination, and so forth is another way of breaking it open and to also appreciate that none of these systems or sectors are monolithic, that there is significant uh, change, exploration, et cetera, going on in each of them. And these are often in a mutually connected. Whether people are aware they're connected or not is different than letting them start mapping out those connections so they can see, they can start leveraging each other's significant work. My sense so far, and it's one of the things I'm going to be looking for this spring as we do the STL project, is where and how does Sharmer's change process invite um, reaching out to find out uh, cutting edge solutions, if you will, um, both as a way of stimulating hope and uh, giving a sense of direction and means to the ends, but also as a changing the conversation so that people are not arguing past each other or staying stuck in their, their current sense of the system. And the last thing, I'll note, I, don't, I won't go on right now unless we have time later, is the um, collective impact model for getting all the parts of a system to come in interviews with each other to start naming what they, how they understand the system to be working that they're in and gradually build a shared map of the dynamics of the system as it currently exists, which again accomplishes both relationship building and trust because it draws a lot of people sharing experiences and the stuff places stuff you were talking about. And at the same time, coming up with a map that they can then turn around and look for places in the system that would be pivotal to create change or opportunities in the system they might not otherwise have noticed and they can both better appreciate each, appreciate each other's uh, constraints and each other's potential contributions. I'll pause there. We're coming up to the last 15 minutes of our time together. So we'll, we, we'll conclude with a sort of checkout round, but is there anything else that people wanted to share or explore with uh, Theory U? You know, I think my summary comment would be that I enjoyed this discussion on it a lot. It makes me want to go back into it and and look at it again and look at some of the tools and practices of it to see how I can 
bring them into the design work and the facilitation work I'm doing right now. I, I for me, it's an extremely powerful design, you know, way to think about processes with a whole bunch of tools um, attached to it. And I, I also think, I mean, this is, it's totally complementary to technology of participation. I mean, I think some of the um, steps in the theory process, top methods can fit in perfectly because they're already using sticky notes and doing affinity work and you could just a little bit farther and suddenly you're doing top gestalts. Um, so I, I'm, I've also just been very interested in theory U because there's a complementarity there between the two traditions and practices. So that's my mm -hmm. final comment. Yeah, I'd like to just follow that with, because um, I've just learned the top method and I, I use dialogue and I see why I needed to learn the top method because dialogue will only take you so far. And if you're going to move into prototyping, you need something like action planning to do that. So I find the two really useful because if you can get people to uh, even dialogue first, then go through an action planning process. I did that just a couple of weeks ago. And then I haven't, what I haven't done is I haven't then followed that after prototyping happens with more dialogue to, you know, to help renew the system. That would be the, probably the theory you, um, next step, um, but I can see how it really fits uh, the the model. So um, mm. I've kind of just fallen into it like that. Um, but this was really great, Mark. Thank you so much for taking us through it. Makes me want mm. to dig in a little deeper myself. Actually, what's come up for me is you've mentioned the top methods, which are great, really great methods for uh, you know emergent processes. One of the things that I think theory you can help with is um, people getting too attached to an action without um, allowing it to be held a bit more softly. Because often when we're in meetings with people, we need to, uh, you know, get to some convergence. And um, often it's the loud voice that sort of suggests an action. And, you know, we, we sort of people all uh, affiliate around that action. But when it gets implemented, it sort of loses traction and momentum. And there's not a support system to sustain people reflecting on their learning. They just get disheartened and sort of abandon the action plan. And, and I think Theory U has got some good scaffolding around helping people sustain their momentum when they're in the uh, implementation or prototyping. In fact, the language is prototyping so that it's definitely free of any risk and you just keep learning as you're doing it. So it's very, um, um, you know, uh, experiential learning and reflecting on your practice approach to action planning. Okay. Well, um, is there any logistics we need to work out for our next meeting or any, any things like that? Yeah. Linda, will we hand over to you just to explain what that is? Well, Nancy, did you have any other final comment before we go into logistics? I just have to pipe in a couple of And Nancy, you're on, on mute. Yeah, my other comment was not meant to be my final comment. Um, I didn't, I posed a question. Perhaps it sounded like a statement or a criticism. It was just a question. My question is to you, Mark, where in the model, if at all, is bringing in cases or studying or exploring, looking for um, alternative ideas of how to address issues, is that um, part of the process at all? And I very, very much appreciated the very last thing you said. It was a wonderful statement of that learning cycle and how it um, breaks through one of the most essential stuck places in trying to do change. So I really appreciate that. I, I wanted to name the question and again, just either to get a provisional answer from you or just to leave it on the table. Thanks. And it's been great. The little bit, I'm so sorry, I missed the first part, but I'll go back and listen to the recording. Thanks. Yeah. If, you're, if I understand your question, Nancy, I, uh, where are there examples of it uh, working well? Um, I think the real no, strength. No, no, that is no. not my question at okay. all. I, I'm looking for those. I'm saying, 
when people are prototyping, when they're coming, trying to come up with possibilities to try out, is there a place in the process where they're, as it were, doing their homework, reaching out and finding out what other folks elsewhere have done yep. in responding to similar situations? Okay. And that, is that part of the process or can it be? Well, one, yeah, so um, it, it, it's building a community. So often there's gatherings. So even in the uh, S-Lab or Societal Transformation Program, there will be cross-fertilization between the 300 teams across the planet through, um, I, I think the best mechanism that they've done is really the, the coaching clinic process, which is quite an intimate group. But they do have um, large gatherings where they uh, try and engage with the community or, or they share what's happening in different communities. So I think they're still prototyping how that gets shared around. Um, they try and summarise, like the, the team in with Otto tries to listen to the whole collective field doing the work and tries to share stories so that people can learn from each other. And there is a, a website, and, and again, different people have different energy for feeding their insights into a website. But I think they're trying to prototype how to really um, accelerate the transition of knowledge and learning across uh, different groups doing learning in the same space around the planet. And, and maybe really they're, what they're doing is cultivating a community, a global community of people who are doing this and, and trying to sustain that so people stay engaged. And as, as stories come out about what people are doing, other people can pick that up and use it. But, but part of the prototyping practice is to definitely uh, stay open to listening to the system and, um, and, and as you do your prototype, there's also a sense of um, when you institutionalize your, or, or embed your action so that it's now uh, not a change process anymore, it's now done its, done its cycle and you're now doing something new and it's a, a part of your practice, you, you start a new you journey. So I think um, the, the, the idea is, is to make sure that that learning is shared um, and the mechanisms are, you know, through, through with people who aren't in the same physical location is to do it through virtual networks and that there's limitations in how that works, but they're trying to build that global community. <clears throat> yeah. Jim? So, uh, <clears throat> would it be uh, anchored to say that <clears throat> the participants in, in the theory you work or of a certain segment in society. You gotta yep. be educated. Yeah. And they're people who would self select as change agents, you know, or yeah. you know, wanting wanting to do personal transformation and systems transformation. So though so you can't transform the system unless you transform yourself. Yeah. So it's definitely uh, yeah. it's a personal development journey for a systems change. And where would that be in the economic, socio-economic layers of society? Uh, well, yeah, people who are, are uh, I mean, I haven't done, looked at the demographics of it. Um, I suppose one of the things is you have to have access to the technology to connect into these global things. So, yeah. you know, you need electricity, computers. Uh, most people would be educated. But they do come from uh, all parts of the world into it. So, um, but you know, we're 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 fairly privileged with all the things that uh, yeah. we've got access to. But people are trying to do work inside communities that are um, haven't got resources. So some of the change projects are probably done by people who've got access to resources, but working in communities that don't. Thank you. It almost sounds like uh, Otto is is trying to create almost like a global DD can, and not necessarily just on climate change, but trying to create a learning community of uh, people doing change work. Yeah, I, I would say that, and and also to make it self organising, so so uh, so that people can take their own initiative, but they can stay connected to others doing the same work. So. I think the Presencing Institute and Otto are trying to prototype a platform 
uh, and a and a system, a scaffolding system to sustain that. So so people who want to be change agents can stay connected to each other and and working on real projects in their communities at the local level, not just an intellectual exercise. Marty, did you have something else you wanted to contribute? Because I, I, we have just a few minutes and we do have some topics to go over. Marty? Marty? <laughs> Marty, are you there? No. no. Oh, I went out again. Am I back? No, I'm yeah, gone. Yeah, we can hear you. Did you have something else you wanted to say before we kind of talk about logistics? No, I keep, I'm afraid to talk. I keep, I think I keep going away every time I talk. I think, I, no, I'm fine. I, I have nothing else to add. No. Okay, well, first I just want to apologize in our last few minutes, uh, Mark. I, I kept thinking that you were going to send me something uh, and so I didn't have to do anything, you know, until I heard from you. And then I didn't hear from you until whenever it was last night. And so that's why I didn't get the notice out. So what's happening, I think, is you all have like kind of figured that I would just let everybody know when the next meeting is. And I'm trying to let that go. <laughs> so yeah. we do as a group need to kind of figure out how logistically we want to self-organize ourselves so that it, it's not always left to me to send out mm -hmm. the link. Um, so that's one question I just have. And then I guess the second question is who's taking it next month? I'm not clear on that. Um, I know Rosa had put a, a Google doc together, but I'm not even sure I know where that is right now. I'm not good on Google docs. Is anyone thinking of doing it next month? I think Rosa was going to run a session next month. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how do we want to do this? Do I mean, part of it is some of us have our own zoom links. And so if we have our own zoom link, I guess, that whoever's going to take on the facilitation could just send out their link. I kind of like keeping it on Kiko chat only because it lets you go back through history to see who did what, when, and you know what that was. It also gives us a place to store things. Like I can put this recording onto, you know, the right. uh, Kiko chat, but I'm not, I'm not wedded to it. If we want to change formats, that's fine too. So what are some of your thoughts? I, I like it on Kiko chat for the reasons you just articulated, unless someone has a strong desire to do it independent. And I think if, if we understand that we, we can cut and paste your login information, right? It doesn't change. Am I correct? So we well, I'm not, not clear. I mean, you, you would need, if you were going to like facilitate next month, Marty, um, and you didn't use me to put it on Kiko chat, you would need to get onto Kiko chat and then add to the calendar and then copy the link, right? And then send it out. And if you wanted to send pre-materials out, that's up to you. But that way I'm out of it. You know, we all just go to Kiko you chat. would like is for us to learn that skill and just yes. do it. Yes. I, think I'd, I think that's reasonable. I'm not sure I'd know how to do it. I think I'm on for April, but. I think I think we should give it a go, and Rosa hopefully will remember how to do that for next month. Okay, well, I will be. I will take it on myself then to let Rosa know she's going to put it on Kiko Chat, um, and then I think each time we just need to say, okay, who's taking it next time, and is there a problem? Where if any of you have a problem with putting on Kiko Chat, you know where I am. Just give me a buzz, and I can just go over how to do it. Does that does that work for people? Is it as simple as uh, under upcoming live teleconferences, just clicking the add button? That's and, it. Yeah, and getting the link there. Oh, well, that sounds straightforward. Super easy. Super, super easy. So, yeah. uh, let's, so then we're making a decision to keep it on Kiko Chat. Each person who's facilitating will make sure they give enough warning. And now the only other issue I have is that Rick can't make Tuesday nights. So um, do we want to find another evening? night um i know i can't do wednesday nights i could possibly do thursday nights uh, and usually friday and mondays aren't good just because people travel um do we want to change for rick how, how would you all feel about thursday nights i guess it would be the second thursday night of, of the month i can't do second thursdays okay I, I can't do second but i could do first or third 
Mark, do you have any? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, this time works best for me, but uh, I'd have to look more. I don't think I could make a decision on it right now in the short amount of time we've got left. I, I don't think, um, I think we need to get more input, maybe a doodle poll or something to resolve that question. Well, okay, since I've been doing it, I will make a note. I will contact Rosa. I will put a doodle poll out and see if the second Thursday, well, I'll, actually, I'll do, I'll do first, second, third, fourth Thursdays or Tuesdays, and we'll see what we come up with. Does that work for people? Good. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you. Linda. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. for the confusion. This one. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Mark. That was great. <laughs> Thanks. Well, let's do it. Let's just do a quick checkout round. So, what's been valuable about today's conversation for you? <clears throat> I'll start. One thing that stood out to me was your examples. I really enjoyed hearing about the case clinic and about the theater, the system theater. I really appreciated hearing that it really is a conceptual model and that we as OD people have to operationalize it. And I really liked the review of the three stages because that, that, that's always going to be with me now. And how to use the dialogic skills of deeper listening at that emergent level. And then how to even want, even how to take on the up leg, uh, the prototypes and you know, kind of reuse the dialogic deep listing model to see how we can self-correct. So it's a real living model. It's a, almost a circle, not a U. So thank you for that. That's, that's good. So I, uh, uh, this session helped me gain confidence in the uh, uh, concepts. And uh, I've been a little cynical about uh, Senge and, and uh, Aldo. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps Senge's uh, trip into Buddhism and stuff, and, uh, and I, I know that's that's useful, and that's part of presidency. And uh, but I come away with a, a much a greater sense of the value of the framework. Uh, and for me, uh, I've valued how the dynamic of the conversation's gone. I was worried a bit that, you know, um, it might be a bit too much centred on me. I mean, I did do a lot of talking, but I, I think that's worked out all right this time. So I've, I can overcome that little voice of fear. Um, and I'm listening to everyone here now. I might try and find some more simple uh, slides or images that could... Uh, just share a bit more of some of the processes. There's quite a lot of interest in the process of these. So I'll try and find something like that and share it with you. For me, um, I really, one of the things I really, really value in Sharmer's work is the depth and subtlety and heartfulness of his critique of the larger systems and what is needed and the connection between personal and social transformation. And I find his models very helpful ways of connecting the pieces. What I valued in the part I got to hear this evening, Mark, was to really see it kind of grounded in practice and start grappling with the issues and where it can either be a, a different approach or it can complement or round out some of the places that current processes can get stuck. So thank you, it was, uh, it's, I feel like I know who to turn to, <laughs> to go deeper with some of these questions. So thank you so much. Okay, well, thanks. Is that everybody? Yeah, I, th I think it is. Well, thanks very much everybody and uh, see you next time. And thanks Linda for organizing that next bridge into our self-organizing system. <laughs> My pleasure. And remember too, we can all take responsibility for inviting new members in, but we're kind of like their guide and mentor until they're integrated. So Nancy, yeah. that was a good, um, a good modeling of bringing Christine in. Yeah. Great. Thank okay. You. Bye. Bye.